Gentlemen, good afternoon. A very sincere welcome. And uh, just before we get into the uh, protocol -y bits, it's just lovely to have people back and to have a face-to-face -face activity. And uh, just a warm welcome. It's a, it's a delight to see so many people turning out, and thank you. I'd like to um, um, pay our respects to country. On behalf of us here, I'd like to pay our respects we pay respects to the elders, past and present and future, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people of this land. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, the Gadigal of the Aora people. We're on land that was ceded or sold, and always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd like to particularly welcome you as President of the RUSI, and a particular warm welcome to everyone. And I might remind you that this is also being, uh, in old-fashioned terms, video cast. So you will be able to watch it later uh, as a webcast. I'd particularly like to acknowledge, and he will be properly introduced in just a couple of minutes, uh, our guest speaker, Mr Shane Fitzsimmons, the New South Wales Resilience Commissioner. Shane, thanks very much for fitting us into a busy schedule and we look forward very much to hearing from you in a moment or two. I, we have a number of vice patrons and I'm particularly pleased that today uh, we're able to welcome one of our vice patrons, uh, Mr Chris Jenkins, who is sitting in the middle. Uh, Chris is the Chief Executive of TALUS, Australia and New Zealand, and you're probably aware, if you're not, that TALUS is a very, very significant defence industry uh, employer with a wide range of uh, facilities including, in New South Wales terms, uh, the Garden Island Dockyard and the Lithgow Small Arms. That's how I used to call it anyway, whatever it's called at the moment. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the presence of Miss Victoria Benz from uh, DVA, New South Wales. And uh, we met almost by accident because uh, here, a few weeks ago, was the New South Wales celebration of the RAAF 100th and we happened to be sitting next to each other. So with the, uh, with, with the typical, uh, who, well, why not, of all small guys, um, I asked Victoria if she, she could come, and I was delighted that she's able to come. Our patron, the Governor, has made a particular point of apologising that she was not able to be here today. And she said, and I think it's appropriate to pass it on, I wish I could have come because I'd actually like to support Shane. So I'd like to just pass on that particular apologies, and there are many others uh, which we can't acknowledge properly. Today is just one of a series of lunchtime lectures, that's our term, but they haven't been happening much at a lunchtime until now, uh, on the theme of improving resilience. And could I just say to you that if you'd like to go to our RUSI New South Wales website, that you will see that in January we had a fairly well-known New South Wales futurist called Keith Souter. Keith commentates on Channel 7, if you haven't seen some of his commentary work. And he basically tried to give us a perspective of, you know, what's the future within Australia from which we need perhaps to become more resilient anyway. We then had Vince De Pietro, who some of you might have known was the commander fleet air arm, then he went to become Chief Executive of Lockheed Martin Australia and in the role that he spoke he was the New South Wales Government appointee for the recovery processes of the South Coast fires and COVID. And Vince spoke, I thought, in very compelling terms about some of the resilience lessons that we should and could have taken out of that really disastrous South Coast experience of approximately 12 months ago. So I commend that to you. It's available as a webcast. And one that I found unexpectedly challenging was Andy Robertson. Uh, he is the Chief Medical Officer of Western Australia, but he's also a Commodore Reserve in the Navy. And uh, I was having a very quick lunch with Shane and we both spoke about the fact that we wonder if Western Australia will continue to belong to us uh, with some of the kind of, no, but damn you, we're locking it down, it's your problem, uh, kind of attitudes that you see at times. But having said that, if you want to look at some really challenging thinking, he shared with us some of the issues of how he led the state and advised the government 
during the COVID, uh, and it's a very instructive webcast. Uh, as a professor of management studies, I basically replied to him and said, there's a great textbook there, mate, <laughs> because he really talks about, it's about managing a crisis. It's not about managing an organisation. It's not about managing parts of organisation. It's just how do you pull it all together to manage a crisis? And that's a very different set of theory and an interesting difference, full stop. What I'm really recommending is, could you keep following us? We, we'd love to have you turn up, but it's not always convenient on a, on a Tuesday. I don't want to take any further time from Shane, and we've got an introduction coming now, but when you have finished today and listened to Shane, then could I invite you to do one or more of the following. Firstly, come across and have a look at our library. And in particular, have a look at the commemorative book that was laid up or dedicated uh, about two weeks ago in celebration of the 3,942, I think I'm going to get corrected, of, of the people who uh, literally were killed in World War II uh, in the RAAF. And there is a magnificent copper plate record of every name, and it was dedicated here two weeks ago. And uh, the commentator is sitting up the back. He did a terrific job, and, and Jeff was the MC for that particular program. Please look around the Anzac Memorial if you have a chance. Not only is the original part very moving, I find the new extension very moving, where you'll find a soil sample from every suburb of anyone who has enlisted from New South Wales and on the floor you will find a soil sample of the battlefields including up to and including Tarrant Cout. It's quite moving when you understand the significance uh, of that particular memorial. And finally, could I introduce, where is he? Greg Stevenson. Greg, uh, there. Greg, uh, we would like you to, to buy a book from Greg. <laughs> so in very simple terms, we get donated a lot of serious military books we declare some of them surplus and we raise funds by selling them. So they're on display or please can you talk to Greg and thanks Greg for providing that service. Please, could you help us in the library? Can you be a volunteer to help us to keep it open? It is a library of national significance going back to 1888 when the New South Wales military was actually probably the original Australian military. And finally, can you just tell everyone you know that you had a good day today? Please tell people about RUSI and we thank you. It's my pleasure now to ask our lecture coordinator, uh, Colonel Ken Broadhead, if he could introduce Shane and ladies and gentlemen, now the real event, our speaker for today. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, uh, Professor Howe, Michael. Our guest today is one of the best known and highly regarded people in New South Wales. He was New South Wales nominee for the 2021 Australian of the Year, and millions around the country on Australia Day Eve saw him, and many in the state would already have known of him. He's well aware of the pain disaster victims endure, having lost his own father in a fire in Karingai State Park. He served in the Rural Fire Service from 1985 as a volunteer and from 1995, 1994 full-time. He was commissioner for 12 years until early last year. Um, in 2019-20, he guided the statewide, statewide response, including a 74,000 strong crew of mostly volunteers through one of Australia's worst fire seasons. And there were a few rain and dust storms and floods added to the mix. Uh, during part of the national fire storm, I worked as a state emergency service member in the, on the bushfire information line at RFS headquarters at Homebush. Uh, we had an early start, but the commissioner came in, told us what sort of a day he was expecting, and thanked us for coming. He didn't have to do that. He then went back and dealt variously with the media, ministers of state, New South Wales Premier, ADF and more. I saw the range of diverse organisations and people represented all in harmony. His current role is head of the Government Department Resilience New South Wales. Now this is focused on communities being prepared for and supporting their recovery from any crisis or disaster. In his Australia Day address, he mentioned the pandemic 
another huge challenge in which every citizen is involved. The concepts of resilience are, are now widely mentioned in the Australian Defence Force, sporting codes and businesses. I'm not convinced that the concept is all that, all that well understood, including by me, uh, nor how it should be manifested in operational and logistics planning and interagency cooperation. Resilience New South Wales is the state's lead disaster management agency. It oversees and coordinates emergency policy and service delivery to pursue a formidable range of objectives, which include economic and infrastructure outcomes and some related to the natural environment. We invited the Commissioner to address us on the issue of resilience in Australia based on his experience in the current role and former role as Commissioner of the Rural Fire Service. Please welcome Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Ken, and uh, good morning or afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's an absolute privilege uh, to be here today. Uh, and can I start by acknowledging uh, your president, uh, Professor Mike Howe, uh, and of course, uh, the entire Rusey uh, family. Um, it is, as I say, a privilege to join you. Mike, I don't know if it was wise to put the list of previous speakers up because I feel incredibly uh, intimidated right now, uh, given what was there. Um, and to talk about the subject of resilience uh, is very broad, uh, but for me, uh, I'll try to uh, raise a few things, um, and I think I've got 30 minutes, uh, and then hand over to some questions, discussions, or indeed some challenges. If you disagree with me, that would be wonderful. Um, but for, for the new organisation Resilience New South Wales, uh, it came about uh, in the middle of, of our worst ever bushfire season the state has experienced. Indeed, it was an unprecedented uh, fire season for the state of New South Wales <clears throat> in terms of the protracted nature, uh, the early start, the late finish, um, the extraordinary wide-scale destruction and devastation, uh, and indeed the tragedy. It, what's, it's not Australia's worst bushfire disaster in terms of casualties. Uh, we've only got to go back to February of 2009, uh, where we've had Black Saturday uh, impact Victoria. Victoria. <clears throat> and in effectively one afternoon, uh, with three fires predominantly, uh, 173 people lost their lives. <clears throat> in New South Wales, during the 1920 fire season, we lost 26 lives, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in the middle of the fire season, because I had signalled to the government that I thought it was time, after being Commissioner of the RFS for more than 10 years, that I should look at a change, uh, and I was originally going to leave before the fire season and given that it was shaping up early I thought it was unwise and I thought I'd stay but we had no idea it was going to be as bad as what it was uh, and then as we turned out through the middle of the season given the unprecedented damage and destruction the government knew then and there that they were going to have a recovery, a rebuilding, a reconstruction and a healing effort like they've never seen before in the state of New South Wales. So they talked about setting up this new organisation around recovery and disaster um, uh, preparedness um, with the statutory responsibility of leading recovery. And they asked if I'd be interested in taking on that role and I said, yes, I would. When it got close to the announcement, uh, they decided to call this new organisation, instead of recovery and disaster uh, preparedness, they decided to call it resilience. And I said, what the bloody hell's resilience? Who's, who's come up with this name? No one's going to connect with that. No one's going to relate to that. It's not going to be, and they said, Shane, this is what we're looking for. We want it to be much broader than just the tr traditional vernacular of recovery and, and disaster preparedness. And I have to say, uh, I've eaten a lot of humble pie uh, in the last 12 months because I think the word resilience, I don't know whether I've just been finally attuned to the word, uh, but the word resilience seems to have come up more in 2020 and 21 than I could ever recall uh, uh, in, in my life, uh, and I think for good reason. Our remit as an organisation, after a, a couple of months of, of contemplating and evaluating what the new remit of this organisation would be, how do we meet government expectation, how do we meet um, uh, emergency services, emergency management framework expectations, and importantly, how do we meet community societal expectations. Uh, our remit now, our vision is from prevention through to recovery, uh, we need to give confidence to our communities across New South Wales to live, work and invest. And we will do so through leading and coordinating disaster management and recovery 
drive strategies and investments, importantly, to reduce risk and build resilience of communities to significant external shocks and stresses of all kinds. There's a lot of words in that. And I know in my first few months of taking on the role, I researched a lot, I read a lot, but importantly, I listened a lot and I asked a lot of questions of people about what they viewed as resilience. Invariably, most people will come up with a narrative uh, that's something along the lines of our ability to withstand some big shock, some big disaster, uh, and bounce back to normal. I struggle with that because the whole idea is if you've been through a difficult period or an, an enormous event, you want to come back better and stronger and wiser. What is normal after you've had a pretty significant disaster or traumatic experience? You've got to learn and build on that experience, come out the other side better and stronger. But importantly, going forward, how, to prepare, how do you prepare yourself, how do you prepare your business, your, your family, your, your community to anticipate and ready yourself for that next big disaster, be more proactive at prevention and mitigation arrangements leading into it, dealing with it decisively, and then of course coming out the other side, uh, rebuilding, repairing, reconstructing and importantly healing. And I think you've only got to go uh, really over the last 18 months to two years to really get a sense of what we see uh, is resilience and resilience across New South Wales in particular will be my lens uh, of focus today for obvious reasons. But when I look about the last 18 months to two years, you can't go past the extraordinary uh, and undeniable compounding effect of disasters uh, on many communities. And if we turn our time back to, to 2019, early 2019, coming into, coming into the middle of 2019, we had 100% uh, of the geographic area of New South Wales, drought declared, drought affected. It was one of the worst droughts we've seen uh, in centuries uh, in, in recorded history. Um, that became the backdrop uh, to what turned out to be uh, our worst ever bushfire season. There's a couple of phrases you won't find me using out of the last 18 months or so. The first one is black summer. Uh, bushfires and the second one is social distancing and I'll get to that a little bit later. But the first one around black summer bushfires, I won't use the phrase uh, because I think it does an extraordinary disservice uh, to all those that were being so heavily impacted and affected by bushfires on top of what they've been living through uh, for years with drought. We were averaging more than a thousand fires a month in New South Wales in winter, uh, uh, June, July and August, over a thousand fires a month. Uh, in 2019 and then it just intensified as we went into spring and summer uh, and indeed people were losing livelihoods, people were losing businesses, people were losing homes uh, and we were also losing uh, loved ones uh, in New South Wales uh, well before summer kicked in. Uh, we lost 26 lives uh, during the 1920 fire season. Uh, the first of those two lives were lost uh, in October before we went into the into the summer period. So the season was unprecedented um, and, and not only did we see through the bushfire season, uh, we then saw um, when the weather finally broke, it was the longest um, uninterrupted period of time without any meaningful rainfall uh, leading into a spring and summer period. It was identified as having one of the latest onsets of monsoonal activity up in northern Australia, which finally brought some moisture down into the centre of Australia uh, to break up that hot air mass that was dominating the weather patterns and delivered some moisture. That didn't come uh, until February. And when it came in February, boy, did it come in a number of areas. Uh, and the storms came and the rains came uh, and across a very denuded landscape, a denuded landscape from drought uh, and from fires, uh, we saw those storms and those extraordinary rain events result in some pretty significant flooding, erosion, landslides, and what, what people hadn't lost during the drought or the fires uh, in a number of locations they were seeing it being washed away uh, in, in the rain events. That was in February. And then as we all know, um, as we were just getting our head around uh, all that came with the fires and an ending to the season in, uh, in February uh, and dealing with the storms and the floods, uh, as we came into March particularly, uh, we were well and truly into the thick of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and learning as a, as, as a community, as a state, as a nation, as a world, uh, just what the challenges were in responding to 
and living through a COVID-19 pandemic uh, and all the all the peculiarities and the uniqueness associated with this particular with this particular virus. So when I reflect on the last 18 months or so, um, I reflect on communities uh, that have been impacted and terribly affected by not just one disaster, but for some of them four or five very public disasters, let alone all that's going on in their personal lives. I think COVID has been a remarkable leveller for all of us, uh, no matter who we are, no matter where we are, no matter what we do, um, uh, where we work or where we live. COVID has reached and touched us all. And I think it's reminded us all to pause and think about our own level of susceptibility and vulnerability. Because more often than not, in my experience, over decades with fire and emergency services, disasters happen somewhere else. We are remarkably generous, we're considered, we pour out all sorts of assistance and support and love to those impacted, but we very quickly transition back into life as we know it. But I think what COVID has done uh, on the back of some pretty significant events has levelled us all and reminded us that we are all susceptible to different things. And for many of us, uh, they've been living through some pretty extraordinary events. If I reflect on the fire season and in particular the toll it took on, on, on New South Wales, just over um, 12, or just under 12,000 fires burnt during that season um, and most of them simply started and spread uh, very, very quickly. We lost five and a half million hectares, the largest area burnt in recorded history, um, particularly along the, the forested area, the Great Dividing Range. The only good thing in a drought from a fire point of view uh, is that there's no fuel west of the Great Dividing Range. There was nothing on the ground to burn, so the fires were all concentrated along the Great Dividing Range, and they spread from the Queensland border uh, to the Victorian border. We had high intensity operations that went for 160 days and bushfire emergencies that were declared for 200 days. So you're talking five to six months. Whereas if you look up in the history books of New South Wales for big bushfire seasons, you'll often find that at the most, the high intensity periods might last two to three weeks. Yes, they do a lot of damage, but there's usually a weather, a big weather event that disrupts that cycle and brings fronts and, and rainfall and what have you. We lost, we lost 26 lives, as I said, including seven firefighters. Uh, four volunteers paid the ultimate price, uh, along with three air crew uh, when the plane crashed uh, down near Cooma um, uh, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in January. So it was, it was an awful period at a, at a personal level, at an organisational level, at a societal level. But the thing that will stick in my mind the most, that despite how deflating it was from time to time, I recall very vividly getting down to 40 or 50 fires uh, and we were thought we were making big progress. In any other given year, that would have just been a horrible day. But we were actually getting somewhere with 40 or 50 fires. And then suddenly the, the frontal system would start coming across the state and then you'd find, instead of bringing moisture, all it brought was more lightning storms. And then within 12 hours of the lightning passing across the Great Dividing Range, we'd gone from 40 or 50 fires back to 170, back to 180 fires, all of which were taking hold and spreading, many of which were taking hold only hundreds of metres from a control line that firefighters have been working on and protecting communities from for many weeks. So their efforts over you know, a month or so were now thwarted because uh, we've got this extraordinary fire now spreading uh, just to the east or whatever it was of the line they were holding. We also found fire behaviour uh, going beyond um, uh, conventional wisdom and understanding. So we had computer simulation models and we had fire behaviour experts doing manual predictions of fires. And historically speaking, <coughs> the very best um, um, uh, predictive service specialists would identify that under certain conditions the best case scenario that a fire will spread will be here. The worst case scenario is the fire would get to there uh, and invariably due to local factors it would go somewhere in between and they were, able to, they were able to estimate pretty accurately where the fire would spread. What we were finding during this season was that fires were spreading beyond the worst case scenario. But they were spreading beyond the worst case scenario at 2, 3 and 4 in the morning, not at 2, 3 and 4 in the afternoon like you would normally expect fires to be at their worst. Again, it was a reminder of the, of the extraordinary effects of the drought uh, and the weather-driven elements that were driving fire behaviour 
uh, at levels we simply hadn't seen. When the fire season settled and our focus was on recovery, we knew there was a lot of recovery, rebuilding, there was a, there was a need to focus on betterment. So one of the best, best things we've got to learn out of when it comes to resilience and helping communities and helping individuals after disasters. And I've been around a few decades where we always argue about the need for betterment funding. So, so the classic example is the old timber bridges, low-lying bridges. They burn down in, in fires uh, and they don't uh, give a lot of passage in even low to moderate floods. They get inundated pretty quickly. But over the decades, when a timber bridge is damaged through a flood or indeed through a fire, we argue about whether we should replace it with something bigger and better and taller and the arguments go around and around and around between the different layers of government and we end up building the same bloody bridge back uh, and wondering why uh, it burns down and doesn't help us with flood in the future. Well, this time round, with, 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 with good um, uh, operations at all levels of government, we're seeing the timber bridges that were damaged and destroyed, particularly up through the north coast, all being replaced with concrete bridges. Uh, we're seeing the concrete bridges replacing the timber ones uh, and we're also seeing uh, sensible increases in height uh, to allow those communities to address what would otherwise isolate them throughout the year with low to moderate floods. So betterment is also about uh, focusing and, 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 and assisting with, with building resilience at a community level. We talk about rebuilding, reconstruction, repair, uh, all those sorts of things are really important. What we don't talk enough about when it comes to resilience uh, and getting people through recovery and anticipating the next event is healing. Uh, the emotional and psychological toll that's occasioned to individuals, to families, to, to business owners, to, to, to primary producers, to local communities is enormous. Um, and at the core of resilience for me, it comes down to lived experiences. Uh, as as um, I mentioned in the Australia Day address, what we conveniently overlook as society too often than not for me uh, is we is yes we live experiences we learn through those experiences and hopefully as individuals uh, as families as communities we learn together from those experiences to be better off next time something challenges us but what we conveniently overlook too often uh, is the emotional toll that's occasioned uh, through those difficult experiences and more often than not uh, the big disasters the big events the big incidents that impact on the way we live uh, and work and function uh, have an extraordinary emotional toll. Uh, it can be quite traumatic uh, for the individuals. Uh, and I know in my travels, when I catch up with people at evacuation centres, at recovery centres, at, you know, uh, at staging areas and what have you, it's pretty confronting when you, when you catch up with people uh, who are emotionally broken down uh, and you ask how they're going and they say they're okay, but they're very emotional. Uh, but what they can't do, uh, they'll say things like, I can't even prove to you who I am. I don't even have identification. How am I going to go from here? Everything I've owned is now ash and rubble. Um, um, they know they've got money in the bank, but they can't go over and get anything out of the bank to pay their way to get the next meal. It's really difficult to put yourself in that person's shoes and work out how will they go forward, how will they get on. So, so the emotional challenges are quite extraordinary. And it's through those lived experiences, and resilience for me starts at the individual, and extends then to the family and social network, it extends through to our business and our employment areas, and it goes right through to that community level. One of the most confronting phone calls I had uh, towards the uh, end of 2020, uh, over, the, over the Christmas New Year period, marking the, um, marking the anniversary of some pretty traumatic events, I caught up with an old RFS colleague on the phone one night. We were reflecting on some, on, on some circumstances. And it was an emotional conversation. Uh, there was tears at both ends of the phone. Uh, but he, I said to him, how are you travelling? He said, look, I'm getting some support. It's really making a difference. I said, that's fantastic. And he said, yeah, those professional services have really helped me process a few things. I said, what's it doing for you? He said, well, he said, I didn't realise how much I was shutting my wife out and the kids out, and I'm really making a difference there, and we're getting along a lot better, and I can see the difference. He said, but it's also helping back in the workplace, and I'm getting along better with the volunteers, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, that's really great. I'm, I'm proud of you, et cetera, et cetera. And we're about to part ways on a conversation and he said to me, Shane, before you go, you've got to promise me something. I said, what's that? He said, you can't tell anyone. I said, can't tell anyone what? He said, you cannot tell anyone that I'm getting help. And I said, you've got to be flippin' kidding. I didn't say flippin'. Um, I said, you've got to be kidding. Uh, after everything that we've, that, that we've been through and after everything that we've just talked about, you've somehow got this shame about... He said, well, Shane, I don't want anyone to judge me. 
I don't want anyone to think that I'm not coping. I don't want anyone to think that I'm not up to the job of, of, of what I really want to come back to and continue with. I just need to process some things. And out of all the things that I'd experienced, that was the call that confronted me and challenged me the most. But then I weighed that up against a lot of the conversations that I've been having as I visited and travelled around rural and regional New South Wales into disaster affected areas. And I cannot tell you how many times people would approach me, uh, um, and I'm going to call out men here in particular, because I think we are the worst offenders, and there's a lot more that we've got to do uh, uh, as men, um, in my view. But the number of wives, the children, the grandchildren that said to me, can someone please talk to my husband, my father, my grandfather? He's wandering around the property, reckons he's going to do everything himself, won't put his hand up for any assistance, reckons there's people worse off that should be accessing the supports and the programs, uh, and certainly won't have a conversation about how he's, how he's feeling. And their plea is, can someone get to him because we don't want him to give up on life? We don't want him to get so overwhelmed that he thinks he can't get through and that there isn't hope and a way forward. And I find that really distressing. But what I also find is, if we're going to focus on resilience, we've got to focus on oneself. We've got to focus on ourself and be honest with ourselves. And when these lived experiences happen, when we confront difficult circumstances, when we confront uh, emergency and disaster scenarios, it's okay to acknowledge that there's an emotional toll attached with the carnage and the damage and the destruction uh, and the despair and the contemplation of what's happened and what you've lost and then more importantly how on earth uh, am I going to go forward and come back after after what we've just experienced. It's okay to acknowledge that there's an emotional toll attached with that because we're human. And, and if I could make one plea when it comes to resilience, men particularly, have a look in the mirror and give yourself permission to understand that you've got thoughts and feelings and emotions like everybody else and talk to each other, talk to your partners, talk to your families, but talk to your mates about how they're feeling and how they're processing. Because the minute, in my view, you give yourselves permission to open up to one another, the quicker, the more realisation there is that you are not alone, that you are not odd, uh, that we are all experiencing things in different ways and to different degrees and it's perfectly normal. If Mike and I go in for a shoulder reconstruction um, and Mike's out playing tennis again in six or eight weeks because he's fit and he's following all the rules from the physio but I'm still there eight to twelve weeks later, no one gives a bugger. So why do we have this challenge when it comes to individuals, uh, all of us, uh, needing to process things differently needing to get different supports and different perspectives because our predisposition coming into any event or any disaster is different. We all carry our own personal and emotional baggage from whatever's going on in our life. We're experiencing similar things and then we're all quite different coming out the other side even though we experience similar things. So the more we can share and the more we can support one another, the core to resilience starts with the individuals in my view. I would also challenge you from a leadership lesson uh, and some of my team used to laugh at me when I said this. But don't underestimate the little things, is my view. And when my daughters were little, I used to read them a book at night. And it was a book by a lady called Pam Allen, uh, a great children's author. And the book was Who Sank the Boat? Uh, and it's this little book. It's only about this square, and you flip the pages over. And there's this donkey, a pig, a sheep, and a cow, I think. Uh, and a mouse. And the whole idea is they get in this little rowboat and they've all got to get in the boat and they've got to go across to the other side to get to pasture or whatever it is. I think it's designed to be about volume and mass and all that sort of thing, but for me there's a really good leadership lesson in it for all of us. And the story goes, the big animals get in the boat one at a time and on every page it says, do you know who sank the boat? And as they all get in the boat, the boat gets a little bit lower in the water and they're all getting in to be done steady and a bit of water steps over the side. And then right at the end, it's the mouse that leaps off the, off the jetty, lands on the edge of the boat, and it's just enough to tip the scales of the boat, and they all end up in the drink. And the message for me is, and the message for all of us in my view is, as leaders, as individuals, as carers and those that are concerned for others in life, our family, our businesses, our loved ones, our local community, 
Don't underestimate the importance of the little things and how paying attention to them and sharing your understanding about those little things can make the difference to individual and collective healing. Uh, and if we can heal and come out stronger, set priorities, set focus areas, we will find that that recovery process, the rebuilding, the reconstruction, the priorities, the focus areas, uh, the investments, they will come through collective thought uh, and agreed and shared um, uh, focus areas. So openness, communications, sharing, in my view, goes to the core of building resilience. I will just finish on that final phrase that I talked about, and again, another insight about building resilience in the last 12 months, in my view. I won't use the phrase social distancing. I get it, I support it, I understand what the intention is. But what we're talking about is physical distancing. We are talking about geographic separation that seeks to stop uh, the virus from spreading. So the more we can maintain distance physically, uh, the better chance we've got of limiting the spread of that hideous, that hideous virus. But the last thing we need in New South Wales, in Australia, right now, uh, is to socially isolate, uh, is to exacerbate loneliness and isolation and depression. Um, uh, it's the last thing we need, particularly in a state like New South Wales, where we've had the compounding effect of so many disasters and the recovery efforts in all those communities interrupted and compromised by the implications of COVID. How deflating it was for, for villages and towns and communities to be gearing up for Easter holiday traffic to, to compensate for what they lost in the summer period, only to have it thwarted by travel restrictions and shutdowns and, and, and the fear of the virus. And what we've observed over the last 12 months, and I was talking to some people just, just in the little lunch break here earlier, what I've found, and I've found it personally myself, is that people in 2020 have consciously connected more with family and loved ones, more with workmates uh, and their social circles than they ever would have in 2019 or ever planned to do in 2021 had it not been for the virus. And the ability to connect, I've never heard bloody Zoom in my life uh, until 2020 and I never knew how powerful things like Teams were to be able to connect people up and provide you know, face to face messaging and group conversations and interaction where people were sharing their thoughts and their feelings and their experiences, realising that they were normalising what they were experiencing and what they were worried about was not unique to them. It was actually shared. And the time that we were able to connect with family and loved ones, and particularly in the workplace, the amount of employees particularly that said, you know what, if I was normally going to the workplace, I'd go in, go to the workshop, or I'd go upstairs to my desk, I'd go to the tea room, I might see four or five people. But I'm now part of this organisation where not only am I seeing those four or five people, I'm seeing a whole team and department that I interview I was part of. And I've seen this general manager and this CEO and this supervisor who I've only ever heard bloody emails from. They've got a face. They, they're actually present and they're online telling us what's going on, why it's going on, what the challenges are. People felt included. So social inclusion at whatever your at whatever your organisational level is, whether it's a family unit, whether it's your business, whether it's your social circles, your clubs, your organisations, uh, your employment, it didn't matter. Community organisations were coming together necessarily so more than ever before during 2020 and I think that has been one of the staples of building resilience and strength during very difficult and very uncertain times. I'll finish on a final thing that I picked up on uh, and I think there's a lot of wonderful lessons that all us adults can learn from our children. When I was Commissioner of the Rural Fire Service uh, in, in that 1920 season, I literally received thousands and thousands of cards, drawings, diagrams, notes from kids across schools, from families everywhere, paying tribute and saying thank you to the firefighting effort uh, and all involved in that, in that work. And I've visited quite a number of schools and I've been to some community organisations and some galleries and things like that around the state as they're starting to process the recovering. And what they're doing is they're lifting out some of these wonderful notes that have not only been sent to me but have been shared with others. And what I found in reading a lot of those notes was three phrases tended to come up over and over again that the kids worked out when they spent time with each other trying to process the enormity of what had happened and unfolded in their lives. They worked out through talking to each other that they weren't alone. That said, I am not alone in my thoughts and my feelings and my predicament. And then they, then they worked out in talking to their mates, they could say, you are not alone. 
because I can relate to what you're talking about and I can share my, I can share my thoughts and feelings and views with you. And the final wrap-up was, as the group of kids, they said, we are not alone. And I've got to say, in disaster and building resilience, the more as adults we realise that A, I am not alone, that B, you are not alone, and therefore we are not alone, the more we can come together, the more we can support each other, the more we can anticipate and plan for the next big event, do better than where we were previously, seek to minimise the damage, respond as best we can, and then importantly, leverage that collective thought to how we rebuild and recover and heal coming out the other side better than we were prior to the event. I'll finish there and ha hand over to any conversations or questions. <clears throat> Someone's got to start. Oh, sorry, someone at the back there? Sorry, I'll... I can say where you've got the capacity and the timing to get in and shore up protection, it actually works remarkably well. And the government, uh, only in last year, I think, announced four or five hundred million dollars to do significant timber up uh, to do bridge upgrades across New South Wales. Invariably, a lot of them are remote and difficult to access, but that also reinforces the vulnerability or the susceptibility of those more remote and isolated communities and the criticality for trying to trying to get the right things in place. Glenn. When are you coming back to the RFS? <laughs> no, no, no. Leaving the RFS after a long time, without a doubt, and I've said it very publicly, um, um, was the most difficult professional decision I've ever made in my life. But as I've also said publicly, I think in life, um, the most difficult decisions you make uh, are more often than not the right decisions. Uh, and I think. Um, there's a fine line between um, I never wanted to be that person that outstayed my relevance or welcome in a role or in an organisation and after being there for 12 years um, I thought it was appropriate uh, and professionally necessarily necessary uh, personally and professionally uh, for some renewal opportunity to occur in that organisation and I I'm confident they will go from strength to strength I still stay close with them and I still talk to a lot of people I haven't brought myself to being a volunteer yet because once I start that, I don't think I'll be able to stop. Um, um, and the whole idea is to try and have a little bit more time at home. So, yeah. Anything else? Yep. My question is, you mentioned about replacing low-level wooden bridges with high-level concrete, but the, being a cynic sort of person, I thought, what happened to Windsor, the new high-level concrete bridge? And Windsor was cutting two for days. Well, but it yeah. seems that we're the, we're the politicians and marketing people are, are not showing the people in the state the truth. Well, it, it's it's interesting. So, I did look at that myself and asked the same question. But the um, uh, the good thing about the bridge is it held up, um, and ironically, the bridge was above the flood height, but the approach and the departure on either side of the bridge was under the yeah. under the flood height. Um, getting back to the mainland. So the challenge is, and, and, and in, any, in any other low to moderate sort of flood level, the bridge would have been perfectly accessible. So it is only going to be in a lot of those cases, you can't build bridges up to a height that's going to overcome all, all flood events. But I, I understand the, uh, the cynicism that you raise, but, uh, but a, lot of, a lot of consideration goes into those, uh, those sorts of constructions, because you've got to try and deal with, um, as best you can, the highest volume and, and regular impact and dislocation or disaffection 
uh, to local communities, and you've got to contemplate and plan for those extraordinary events and outer scale events, and what can you do differently or adjust accordingly. And you can't, you can't build or design everything for those those extraordinary events. Even things like the the bushfire construction standards for ho ho homes and development, uh, they're designed up to the extreme category of fire behaviour, uh, but catastrophic is almost like this um, uh, infinite level of behaviour there beyond. You can't design and standard standard up metrics to deal with that sort of thing unless you know you want to go to the extreme of a concrete concrete bunker where everyone should live. Next question over here. Yes. Thanks, guys. Shay, I'm really uh, keen to hear your thoughts on overcoming psychological trauma in communities. Um, <clears throat> my experience obviously a lot more limited. But what I've seen overseas uh, in Afghanistan was that you go into a, a village or a, a large community and uh, there'd be a high level of psychological trauma because of the immediate threat. You know, in that case, it was enemy action, bushfires, and the same physical threat that people were really concerned with. You remove that threat, being a bushfire threat or a enemy action threat, there'd be a definite decrease in, uh, there'd be a sense of relief, if you will. But there was always, there was still this underlying trauma in the whole community, this heaviness in the whole community. And um, from what I saw, one of the, and it would, you, you couldn't do anything, you could bring people in and they'd build themselves, the, the engineers would build a whole new things for them, and it wouldn't really change that underlying heaviness and lack of energy and drive and excitement. And the one thing that I, I noticed, um, that really did do that was when we contracted to local businesses to come in and do the work and the engineers were laid foundations and they'd come in and check each level of work that was done properly and it was a lot of effort, a huge amount of effort to liaise with local business people and, and get them on board but the effect was absolutely incredible. You'd see this excitement and drive in the community come back this lightness this heaviness was like something that's going to solve all the psychological trauma that will happen for many years, but it was a really measurable improvement. And I'm just wondering, I know from your, uh, from your report that engaging local industry and local businesses is a big thing, and I, I suspect that's it's probably a lot easier for your organisation than just to bring in an external contractor just to do it. And I'm just thinking, is, that, is there something behind that? 100%. Okay. 100%. So, so, so um as you would expect out of an unprecedented bushfires, um, there's an unprecedented level of recovery programs and infrastructure um, um, tools and products going out there. Four and a half, four point four billion dollars worth of worth of recovery and rebuilding efforts. But what we've focused on very much, and particularly with the cleanup, that the largest ever operation we did on cleaning up properties, over three thousand, I think three thousand seven hundred um, properties were all cleaned up at no charge to property owners. Even though we went to market for a state contractor to lead and coordinate that, the condition of that contract was to engage local and regional um, uh, contractors. Uh, and most of those contractors, uh, and I think it was something like 90 odd percent of all contractors were engaged locally. The only areas where we had to engage outside of the area was largely around friable asbestos and, and some of those high speciality areas. But to extend the argument a little bit further, I do try and draw the distinction between um, um, the mechanical things of building and repairing and reconstructing and then what is, that, what is that emotional and psychological healing element. And in my view, the best led anything is that which is locally led. So planning, preparation, response and recovery. And, and a lot of the programs that have been rolled out have been deliberately done to solicit from the local areas community projects of priority. And even though, even though communities have experienced the same trauma from bushfires, everybody's experience is nuanced at the local level. And when we ask them to identify and set priorities, that, that community coming together is the big focus about involvement, ownership, drive and prioritisation. And even in one local government area, what's really important in community A can be completely different in their importance ranking to community B. And then you spread that out over 50 or 60 local government areas around the state, you've got a massive um, uh, variation. And our ability with the federal government and the state government to ensure that the criteria for recovery and rebuilding programs is flexible enough and nuanced enough to accommodate that variation is really, really important. 
And what's interesting is community A will put up project B, community B will put up project D, and that's their priorities. But the minute community A sees project D, they're saying, no, that's not a bad idea, we'd like that as well. So, so, so what, but, but ultimately, it's locally led, and what matters to the... I've been to some communities where their single biggest priority is to put a lean-to on someone needs to pay for a lean-to, like a carport, on the side of the local fire shed and a dedicated barbecue because every Wednesday afternoon or Friday night or whatever it is, the community are coming together and they're talking about progress. They're talking about what they're doing individually on their property with their business or what they see as the new challenges and priorities for that community, for that local area to go forward. Now, if we can invest in a lean-to and a barbecue that the, that the community wants, then that's a big tick to me. Some people say, why would you waste your money on a barbecue? Well, you know what? That's what matters. That's the, that's the single biggest thing they want. Rebuilding community halls, you know, doing things like that that really matter in the, in the local community. So having the ability to nuance and deliver locally led initiatives and local, locally determined priorities is the key to a lot of that healing. And, if, and, and my view is, at a state level or a national level, our ability is to sponsor, facilitate, endorse, uh, facilitate that locally led effort. Yes, there's got to be parameters and criteria and all that sort of stuff, but the more we can do that to empower and engage locally, the better off we are. It's always that fine line too between engaging the ADF uh, when it comes into help and support communities. One of the biggest conversations we have, reciprocated conversation with the ADF is, are we coming into an area where there's contractors that could do this work and would benefit from the investment locally. So getting that balance right is always really important. So we don't want, we don't want teams of external people, whether they're firefighters or emergency workers or ADF, coming into a town if the best thing we can do for that town is employ the local you know, waste management services or, or whatever it is uh, that, that would benefit from getting economy turning over and getting money spent in the, in the local town. So yeah, you're right. Um, Prioritising and understanding those local initiatives. There's a whole heap of of programs going on now that are still coming out of the still coming out of the bushfires, and the one thing I forgot to mention at the back end of COVID, March this year, uh, we've just been through one of the worst flood events in the state's history, um, up on the mid north coast and down on the uh, in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley area. Sixty three local governments have been declared natural disaster areas because of those floods. We've got something like I don't know forty five thousand people affected. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage insurance claims, um, 1,400 or something homes that are um, unlivable, you know, that they, they can't get into them. Ironically, um, to, to reinforce the compounding effect of disasters, 60% of those local government areas were also natural disaster declared bushfire areas. So a lot of people had started rebuilding, doing fences, putting sheds back in, getting visitors back together, and they were washed away by the floods. And it was less than 12 months old, the repair work. So, so you're talking about extraordinary. So, so now reaching out to them, what are the priorities? What, what do you need to do? And, and you get community organisations in and Blaze Aid and other groups to help get on with that work. And some of the wash out and clean up was a big focus as well. So, so you, you, you've got to keep driving it local to facilitate, facilitate, facilitate local priority and need, which buys in ownership and support, in my view. Over here, uh... Mr Delaney. Shane, thank you. Uh, great job, Mr. Lady, Veterans Employment Program. If anyone would like uh, to find out about it later, I'd love to talk about it. But Shane, um, when you stood up each day with the Premier and led the state with the response team and that calm voice there, how did you back up each day? How did you decompress at night? Where did you find that strength? That's a really good question I've been asked a lot, Craig. And um, there's something funny that goes on in the human body, in my view, in my experience and adrenaline really does take over. We were getting home really late at night and getting up really early in the morning. And normally I'm a light sleeper, I can't switch off from work, I'm always processing things and I have really disrupted sleep. But what I found was I was setting my alarm every morning for 4 or 4.30, but I, my alarm never woke me. I always woke up about 10 minutes before the alarm was due to go off. Um, and when I got home late at night, I fell straight to sleep, but I woke up at that time. So I don't know what happened there. The, the, the mindset was just, was just tuned in. But the thing that really helped me through the fires was maintaining context. Um, um, yes, I was, I was deeply troubled and I was, I was emotionally um, uh, broken a number of occasions uh, throughout the season, particularly when we were losing firefighters and seeing, seeing how defeated some people felt over and over again with their, with their very best of efforts. But what I found was, 
um, and have, have been part of that organisation for such a long time. When we had every state agency available working shoulder to shoulder and in together, the vast majority of whom were volunteers, when we had every state and territory, the Commonwealth, the ADF, people from New Zealand, United States and Canada, all seamlessly integrated into the largest ever response effort we've, we've, we've delivered. Every day uh, I was inspired to ensure that we did our very best to back them in. And, and, and whatever, whatever press conference I was in, I ended up getting a mental map in my head, A, of what was going on, but B, two audiences and probably five key messages that I stuck to. And my two audiences were the men and women, the volunteers and all their salaried counterparts that were involved in the firefighting and emergency response effort. And the second audience was all those men and women being impacted and affected by the fires uh, and on both sides the families who were supporting them, whether the firefighters and the emergency services, all those people being impacted and affected. So whenever I was talking to the camera, no matter how relevant or stupid the questions were, I had to keep reminding myself the audience is out there, not necessarily in the room asking distracting questions. And whatever we spoke about, I tried to identify five messages, a very honest and candid update of where we were and what we knew. Secondly, or thirdly, uh, what we were doing and why we were doing it. Then, then, then most importantly as well, what we weren't doing, what we didn't know and why we couldn't do it. But then most importantly, what did we want others to do? So for me, it was about praising and acknowledging and paying tribute to the firefighting effort every day and then doing the same thing to all those communities who were making really sensible, considered decisions in light of what was unfolding around them and all that they were confronted with uh, and, and were losing. So being, being as open and honest as we could and then in the afternoons or evenings driving home or in spare time, just ringing people around the state to see how they were travelling. For me, I maintain context. Yes, I was having a tough day, I was having a bad day personally, and as I say, I was, I was pretty broken on a few occasions. But I knew, like everybody else, I had an important job to do, and what I was expecting of everybody else, I wouldn't expect more of them than I was willing to do myself. And I think there's no doubt um, that the people of New South Wales, and particularly the teams involved in the firefighting effort, kept us all focused and I was just doing a part in a massive, extraordinary multi-agency team effort and that's really what kept me going. We have time for one final question, the gentleman on the list. Uh, uh, G'day, Chamber. My name's Nathan. I wonder if we could talk about uh, building resilience or, or indeed building teamwork within the largely volunteer workforce that you had. Um, did you find that they sort of built resilience by virtue of their lived experience? Or was there strategies that you implemented at the organisational level to help sort of engender those sort of characteristics? I think it's a bit of both, Nathan, to be honest, and I think that would go to all organisations. And there's people often ask me, what's the, what's the big challenge about managing volunteers versus, versus managing staff? And I would have to be honest to say very little. The fundamentals are there. One of the beautiful strengths about volunteers is that if they don't feel they're being valued, if they don't feel they're being invested in, if they don't feel they can be a contributor and a team player to something and have their contribution valued and appreciated, then they've got this beautiful art of telling you to get stuffed and going somewhere else where they feel they will get that value and that, and that, and that, and that inclusion. Unfortunately, a lot of staff won't do that. You know, and you get staff that will then stay in an organisation and feel compelled to stay there and they'll get quite cynical and all that sort of stuff. But the principles are the same. And as I used to say to some staff who, who might you know, be a bit cynical for time, I'd say, I'm just reminding you, no one's forcing you to stay here. If the organisation's as bad as what you say, then why are you here and holding on and, and being de uh, you know, um, um, disruptive or, or coercive in the organisation? So, so culture uh, and values is a, is a fundamental uh, focus. Accepted and unaccepted behaviours being really clear. And I think in my time, one of, the, one of the key leadership traits that's really important is making decisions and taking action. Um, in, in any volunteer or salaried environment, there's a lot of research around, I think it's Harvard that does it, 
that they identify the top five things that are demotivators in the workplace or, or in an organisation you're a part of. And often in the top five you will find uh, management, indecision and inaction against poor performance. So making decisions, people are generally happier with those decisions if they're explained than no decision at all. And if you've got somebody who's poor attitude, poor performance, um, I like to use the analogy of a flat tyre. Sometimes that poor attitude, that poor performance, um, just requires inflation. You need to get in there with a pressure valve, reinflate it, minor intervention, find out what's going on, get them back on track with a reinflation. Sometimes you'll realise that there's a puncture in the tyre that needs a little bit more in intrusive work, a little bit more work to, to get them refocused, get them back on track, then you can reinflate and get the tyre going. But then sometimes we've got to realise that the tyre's stuffed uh, and it's about time you got rid of the tyre and swapped it out for a new one and then reinflated it and away you go. And the tyre analogy for me is really important because if that flat tyre is on the front seat of the bus that's carrying your team, your unit, your department, your organisation, then no one's going anywhere until you actually deal with the flat tyre. Um, whatever that intervention requires, you've got to deal with it. You can't keep putting it off. The core of your question is, the leadership and performance through crisis is an amplification or is spotlighted or is microscoped um, as a reflection of what your investment is in peacetime or quiet time. So the more you can invest in the fundamental cultural attributes of behaviours, accepted behaviours, leadership, teamwork, um, um, calling out and learning from lessons, having you know, good crew resource management skills where people challenge and question and work with each other, safety focused, all those sorts of things. The more you invest in people, in systems, in programs, in information flow, the better off you're going to be in times of crisis. And more often than not, the crisis will identify or expose cracks in that system, but unfortunately they become massive crevices or craters because you haven't invested enough up front. For example, our ability to be able to hold daily press conferences with live, accurate, relevant information to all manner of different areas around the state comes from decades of investment um, in, in organisational teamwork and focus around A, responding to and dealing with stuff, but also making sure you're putting through formative messages, you're updating with briefings. Because if I was standing up and doing a press conference saying, oh, we've got X, Y and Z happening up at um, you know, Rapville in northern New South Wales, and my information is inaccurate or two days out of, two days out of um, um, uh, sync, I don't have to worry about the community tearing me apart, the volunteers will tear me apart. They'll say, who is this buffet down there? I mean, he doesn't even know what's going on up here. What's he doing in that role? So, so you've got to invest in your systems and in your culture and in your people around teamwork, around the criticality of information flow, around the need to to be decisive and take a punt, and I think leaders in crisis time and in, and in quiet time, but particularly in quiet time, need to give the confidence of those teams around teamwork and focus that when they make decisions, and even if those decisions go wrong but they've acted in good faith, we're going to back them in. And as I said with a couple of the backburns that went wrong and they lost them and property was destroyed and damaged, um, I said very publicly in press conferences, you've got a problem with these backburns, you come and talk to me. You know, uh, I backed them in 100%. Now, if I didn't, could you imagine the ramifications for every crew member that's out there trying to make life and death decisions literally, um, not to the extreme of military, don't get me wrong, I'm not, but, but, but there are they're, they're critical life and death decisions um, about what they do uh, in trying to deal with those fires. If they were doubting that the hierarchy was going to question them and leave them hang out to dry, we wouldn't have teamwork, we wouldn't have focus, we wouldn't have resolve to make decisions and deliver the very best they could in very, very dire circumstances and truncated periods of time where they've got to make decisions quickly. Thank you. Uh, our president, I uh, will now uh, formally thank our speaker and make some final remarks. Uh, so, could I just say, I hope you reacted to an enormous range of stuff in there, because I did. I sat there thinking right through the presentation, what does this mean for me? What does this really mean for management theory? What does it mean for uh, Phil Force Command? Etc, etc. So let me just give a couple of impressionistic comments and then thank Shane. It just seems to me that I now understand why the Rural Fire Service was so resilient. 
I now understand some of the leadership style and encouragement and training that obviously Shane, leading by example, created in that group. Because as a person who simply wasn't involved personally, meaning I didn't get out there, I just watched these people who were volunteers go into situations where you think, good heavens, you're doing that as a volunteer and you're going back tomorrow? So I hope that you have learned enormously from this. And I'd just like to finish by thanking the last couple of questions because I think that if you watch this webcast, I'd look at about the last 15 minutes over and over and over again. In other words, the comments that have been made by the enormous practical experience of how this actually occurred. I'd like to thank, thank um, Shane for taking on the role of New South Wales Resilience Commissioner. I've got to tell you, I'm not sure there'd be too many of the rest of us putting their hands up to say, uh, we'll tackle that job. We all wish you well. Thank you so much for what you have done for us and for New South Wales. And could you just join with me, please, in thanking Shane. <laughs> it's, my, uh, it's my privilege now to present Shane with uh, a membership of RUSI. Uh, we have a dazzling range of ties. You can have red or blue. <laughs> and I am going to present him with a tie. And uh, in that sense, it's just one of those symbolic thank yous very much, which we hope you might occasionally look at and say, yeah, I remember talking to that lot. Uh, but if that's the case, on our behalf, Shane, could you, show, could you before you go, uh, sign our visitor's book Absolutely. and accept our gift? I'll just give them very quickly now. You can swap it for a blue one. Ah, red blue. Thank you, Mike. Really appreciate it. Thank a you pleasure. so much. <laughs> Folks, uh, could we remind you of the invitations if you have time? Please have a look at the Anzac Memorial. Please come across and have a look at our Library of National Significance. We'd be delighted to show you around. But could I also share with you what we have coming. Uh, the next month is a deliberate network and follow-up to Shane. We have Chris Smallhorn, who used to be the Commander Fleet Air Arm and deployed ADF assets. And Chris is now the Chief Executive of Coulson Air Tankers at Bankstown. And quite deliberately, we have asked Chris, who will, by the way, look at this webcast, he promises me, uh, he will try to make uh, an issue of well, should we buy them or own them or lease them or, you know, in other words, how, how do you deal with the assets required to do this? And it's quite clear that he, he has a very extensive background and choice. The month after that, we have deliberately asked the New South Wales Scout Commissioner, and if you have not seen the Australian story, which, by the way, one of them features Shane, but if you've not seen the Australian story of Mike Cannon Brooks, who now is one of the billionaires running Atlassian, living locally, he says in that Australian story, the most important influence on my development was Pennant Hill Scout Group. And so, in the same way that the military says to a lot of people, you want to be an officer, do this before you apply. Qantas says to a lot of people, you want to be a pilot, do all this before you apply then we hope that you might be interested in what should we be offering, creating and doing to our young people to build up resilience early. And that's the deliberate choice to invite Neville uh, as the Commissioner. And then finally, a point that struck me with Shane, what if you didn't have all those communications to have Zoom? What if someone took them out? And could I just make the comment that the largest section of the PLA is the Cyber Army. <laughs> so could I comment that we have deliberately asked the head of uh, Cyber in at least the Army to talk to us the following month. We hope that that will be stimulating and challenging and interesting. Could I thank you for coming today and again, thanks so much, Joan. Thanks everyone.